Hi, this is Milton Gray. The oral history you are about to hear was actually edited together from several different taped interviews done mostly in the 1970s. At that very moment, I got the idea to going over to Warner's. And I took my sketches and so forth. Then they started the Merry Melodies in the first of 31. That was when I joined them. They originally were on Western Avenue. They moved over into a building. On Hollywood Boulevard. The cartoons from 31 to middle of 33 were made there. And when I joined them, I, they moved me right in the same room with uh, uh, Rudy Ising and Chris Freely, with the three of us in the room. You know, today, if you went to a studio, uh, you wouldn't be put in the same room with a co-owner, see? <laughs> well, the first morning, they just gave me the drawing in Bosco and I need to practice from. And I sat and just made one drawing after another, working straight ahead, making a final detail of the goat uh, with a fly going around. And, and he turned his head and he was swatting at the fly with the tail. It was partly like a hand. It was just an ad lib thing I thought of. Rudy Ising sees this and he flips it. And I had about 50 drawings already. And he says, hey, that's, you know, that's pretty good, you know, first morning. <laughs> uh, but he says, uh, he says, you need more burlesque in it. Rudy said, I, I needed more burlesque, maybe more exaggeration or something than I had. It's maybe a little tight, you see. So the next thing you know, whether it was that day or the next morning, uh, Hugh comes in and gives me a, a crowd scenes uh, from the first Mary Melody, you know and shows me how to animate them. There was M cycles, you know, rhythm cycles and confetti going and all sorts of stuff and streamers and, and saying now, here's what you do here and here's what you do here. And I started off animating. So as crude as it might have been, I was animating the second day I was on the studio and it was and my animation was used in the picture. It was the first Mary Melody ever made called uh, Lady Play Your Mandolin. And I bit my tongue a long time, and then it was in the first or second meeting, I can't remember which, but it was the first week, is when I blurted out with this idea for the guys on the streetcar coming to life, you see. Uh -huh. And uh, I could feel that the, uh, that, that was about the most unpopular thing I could do, was this smart, snotty-nosed kid that just started there Monday, and now he's coming up with a sequence with a whole bunch of ideas for it, and telling it out with a little enthusiasm, and the boss is saying, hey, that's pretty, you know, that sounds great, you know, or something of that nature. And the next thing you know, Howard Hansen, you know, the production manager, Howard and I rode home in the streetcar, and he told me, he says, uh, uh, he said, I overheard you talking, that they, they think your car ad sequence is great, and they're going to use it in the picture. They, and I, I had sketched up a lot of it and had a lot more ideas and they ended up just, you know, cutting it down to a very short thing. And, uh, but, but nevertheless, here was my first clash with what was this kind of reluctance to have some real fun put in the cartoon. Now at that time, all the Warner cartoons looked like a, a replay of the Disney, you know, the dog going along sniffing and Bosco whistling, going fishing, you know, the, the girl and all that. So when I came up with this idea, uh, it made quite a hit. It wasn't that great, but it was part of the cartoon, and the audience really took to it, seeing the Smith Brothers and the Goldust Twins and, you know, uh, all of this uh, in animation. And that led to the first Warner formula as divorced from the Disney formula. And after that, we made magazines coming to life and the grocery store labels. And it, and so uh, so they when I when I hit that they they kept putting me in on stories meetings you know bring call me in from animation to the story meetings or ask me to turn in stuff. Now about this time, Leon also had a contest across the whole studio, a money prize for who'd write the best story, and everybody is you know. Because uh, the footage is down because we're all writing stories on <laughs> the paper. So to make a long story short, I happened to win that story contest. The picture, and then Frizz made it, and he stuck in a uh, singing chorus and pushed out about 13 gags. But it was called uh, My Green Fedora. The story wasn't that good, although he did leave out some better gags that we had. And he injected a Joe Penner, who was a popular comedian at the time, he injected a Joe Penner routine in it which wasn't that funny in the theater, and, and in the meantime, cut out some of the better personality gags, like when, at the end of the picture, when the baby rabbit starts to squeal on the boy rabbit when the mother comes home, these carrots, well, the 
the boy the rabbit stuffs this carrot into the baby's mouth. You know, it's like a big cork in the mouth with a funny expression on the face and the little end of the carrot sticking out. When I showed the story to Leon the first time, he laughed real hard at that, just at that drawing. But Chris eliminated that idea and instead had him doing a Joe Penner again, which was just uh, just putting a stunt in, saying, oh, they'll, they'll laugh at this because Penner's popular. Right. It didn't fit the story, see? Back in 1935, I was also experimenting on a couple of things. Uh, I got the rights to Edgar Rice Burroughs' Mars stories for animation. I wanted to do something quite imaginative, even with a comedy uh, relief, you know, like Doug Fairbanks Sr. had a little tongue-in-cheek humor in it, see? So I made the first sample film on it. So I worked a, a whole year, nights and weekends, when I was working at Warner Cartoons. I worked on, on this animation. Chuck helped me animate it, Bobo in between it. Bobo can in between it. In fact, I filmed Bobo in live action, shooting him as the warrior, you know, as the hero. He was very heroically built, no hips and all shoulders. And then we rotoscoped part of it, you see? That was way ahead of its time. It was a, at that time, and that was before Disney had done Snow White. And so it was like a, a, an exciting thing to, to experiment and uh, try the virgin territory of this realistic, uh, imaginative uh, scenics and characters. After we got some of the animation ready and inked and, and painted, there was no cartoon camera cranes for Ren in Hollywood. It wasn't a very good idea to try to do it at Warner since it was kind of a secret outside project. So I went to FK Rockets Industrial Filmmakers up here on the boulevard who had a camera for photographing titles and I, used, I went in there on Sundays and used their camera I shot all the frame-by-frame -frame animation myself on their title camera there was a problem of color and Edgar Bur Burroughs himself located uh, the Dunning color process over in La Brea and took me there because we couldn't get Technicolor there how much footage would you actually make it was only maybe four or five minutes, something like that. We picked out scenes that demonstrated the characters, but those scenes actually fit in the story that I had outlined. They would have actually been in there. Burroughs himself took the film to MGM. They were at that time at the height of their popularity with the Johnny Weissman at Tarzans, and they were very interested in anything Burroughs proposed. They liked what they saw, and so they were interested in the series. And then I gave notice to Warners because MGM said we were going ahead with it. I had a contract with Leon. When I first went there in 33, he signed me to a contract for three years. That contract ended in August 1st of 1936. So my effort to start my own studio with the Mars thing, with the MGM release, coincided with the end of the contract. When I was making the Porky and Daffy's at Warner's, I set up a studio across the street in 1938 with my associate Al Kendig. And this was our studio, and you'll see, uh, see that we were filming stop motion and this little tinker toy man here, you see? Little man made out of it like a tinker toy, and I'm going to show you the footage that we took at that time in 1938 of that. And it's silent also. He was singing a song like, No, I'm happy about the whole thing. Something like that. <laughs> I had always, when I was, all the years I was growing up and making my own comic strips where I write my own gags and develop my own characters and, and sketch it all, when I got into animation, I didn't have an idea that I'm going to sit and just do a series of drawings you know, for something that somebody else thought up. And I said, wow, this is net. Uh, what have I got to do to be able to think up my own stories and put them into work? And they said, well, you have to be a, a director. So, so right away, I figured, well, I've got to get to that. And so I would spend a lot of time going into the story room uh, and throwing gags in the story meetings. I would turn in a lot of complete stories. I had drawers full of the stories I turned in. So I'm all the time saying, I have ideas, so I want to be a director. About that time, Schlesinger called me up to come back and have a meeting with him, and that's when he said, what does it take to bring me back? So my terms to go into a new contract was more money, but above all was the chance to direct. He said, I have no room for direction now, but I'll guarantee that you'll have the next opportunity to be a director. Now, to show he, that he meant 
uh, what he said at that moment, a job came into the studio for some cartoon lead-ins and lead-outs on a Joey Brown feature picture. Called, uh, when's your birthday? He called me and he said, I'm going to give you your first direction shot here now. And uh, I directed that and laid it out. Chuck animated it and Bobo and Bob Cannon in between it. It wasn't that good a picture, so don't, don't look it up. But at least it was the first time that, that I had officially directed. Your fate is written in the heavens. You cannot escape your destiny. Your guiding planet rules your life. It is our privilege to present a celebrated scientist who will explain astrology in its true light. Professor S. Zohara Burkett. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. People. This is the astromological sun. Twelve divisions. Four days has got September, April, June in Kentucky. All the rest, I don't be sure, except Chicago used to get the World's Fair. Ah, so this is Ares. Saggy trousers, Bourbon's greatest masterpiece. Taurus, that's the bull that won't take move for an answer. Round and round she goes. Where she stops, nobody cares. There sits King Taurus, the moon-kissed bull. When the moon shines, he is public boss number one. Bull meets crab. Crab meets good too on the bull at lunch, 35 cents. They're lizards. Oh, no more crab meat. Holy bull! <laughs> Taros is very unhappy. Saggy trousers gonna horse around a little bit. Take that. <laughs> William Tell is gonna hit him right in the zodiac. Thank you.